<laughs> we finally made it happen. Okay, so I'm gonna hop off. Oh wait, because I, I know everyone's watching this, but still. Uh, so I just read the poem and then you hop back on. Is that how it works? All right. Okay. So I'm live. Everyone can hear me. They they see you. They're saying hi. Oh wow. Um, okay. Frankie's here. Mona's there. Emma's here. So uh -huh. yeah, the list is growing. There are more and more people. So I'll hop off. Okay. You say whatever. Get started, and then I'll come back. All right. I'll see you in a minute then. Bye. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, I don't know what time it is where you are, but it's just after one here in Chicago, uh, in Illinois. And James Baldwin is behind me, as is Miles Davis, my, uh, some of my muses. Um, my name is Chris Abani, uh, Nigerian writer, uh, poet, uh, novelist, uh, many other things. Uh, I've never done this, so this is really awkward. So, so bear with me if I'm making a fool of myself. Um, so this afternoon, I thought what I would do is I'd start by reading a poem. Uh, and, and then once I've, I've read the poem, um, Maza uh, will get back on and we'll have a chat. Because I feel like you can read the books anywhere. But I wanted this to be more interactive. I'm really not good with this. So I can see people saying hi, but I'm not able to, to, to type as fast. All right. So here it is. I'm reading from a new book of poems. Uh, Never been, hasn't been published yet. Well, soon will be. Uh, <laughs> I apologize to all you Christians out there. The title of the book is called Smoking the Bible. And it's sort of in honor of my brother Gregory, who passed a couple of years ago and who taught me to smoke when I was, when I was nine. So this was the summer where I was nine and he was 13. And, um, and, uh, and so after I lost him, I started to write these, what I call love poems to, to him about that summer. So, so here we go. Um, all right. Flay. The point of a pen opens a hole into a soul's dereliction. This search for the right word bores through stone. Sunlight takes no measure of what is clung to. That way a man can place the half dome of a tomato, slice into flesh and cut an island of loss. Migrant, punished by spice and the scent of cooking, you wake up on a cold day in another country and put your faith in hot rice and braised goat and the persistent aftertaste of a lost home. Gospels are made of less than this. But outside it is morning. A summer breeze burns down to the water and the ocean begins. Hi, everyone. So I'm waiting for Maza to jump back in so we can have a conversation. Otherwise, you know, those who know as a Nigerian, I can talk for hours and, and it'll be very unfocused. Uh, so hopefully we can talk about writing. We can talk about uh, poetry. We can talk about uh, pretty much anything. Cool. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Maza's joined. Hey, Maza. <laughs> I was all nervous out there by myself. <laughs> like on the edge of a, like on the ledge of a cliff, you know, waiting for somebody to, to right. come. No, it's very bizarre. Facebook, I mean, Instagram Live, I've never done it. So, um, yeah, it sort of felt like you were standing in the living room in your underwear and couldn't draw the shades fast enough. <laughs> you know, we don't know, but I'm not going to ask that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, yeah, luckily I'm decent from the top up. I'm like those newscasters, you know, yeah. from the waist down. It's like all kinds of stuff going on. That is it. Um, well, you know, I have. Thank you so much for for doing this, Chris. Um, the the first session that we had earlier last week, I was talking on on Instagram about the first time I met you. I was a grad student. I don't even know if you remember. I do, at NYC. Yes. And you were still working on your first book. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It was really um, such a long time ago. You were so generous then. I, <laughs> I never forget that. 
Um, so this is for me really special. So here, here we are. Um, you know, it's interesting that you started out with this poem because I don't really want to talk about Corona, but <laughs> I'm going to mention it briefly. Um, it's been, you know, being in here and listening to the news and the numbered sick and the numbered dying. One of the things that, that I think all, all of us have been thinking about, um, is how do we begin to process what's happening? Because there, it's a very real and deep, and I am, I'm, I'm, I think, permanent trauma that, that we're experiencing now. But as writers, I have also been thinking about how do we begin to express loss? How do we find the words to do that? And in listening to this beautiful, beautiful poem um, that you wrote in honor of your brother, from smoking the Bible, could you talk a little bit about loss and what you called love poems? And one of the things I wrote as soon as you wrote that is these are love poems to a, a past. Um, how do we, how do you express loss in words for something that feels sometimes inexpressible? And is poetry the, the best way to do that as opposed to prose? All right, so we're starting with very easy questions. <laughs> okay, uh, I was just laughing because someone, someone called you out for calling me old. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I am old. I, I earned this stuff, you know. Um, so, so the, coming, I come from a very small town in Nigeria, and I grew up for a long time in that town. So it's, I didn't really grow up in, in cities. So I grew up around very traditional thinking. And where I come from, people, people don't die. People only die when they're forgotten. In fact, that's part of the ancestor veneration is not just that they, they participate in your daily life in this way, but that they're alive as long as you remember them. And, and the truth of the matter is, you know, it's, everyone remembers people differently, even when they're alive, that most of the time, when we're interacting with people, we're interacting with our memories of them um, and not who they are in the moment, right? And, and sometimes we get angry because they're not performing to the memory as we expect them. So, but it hits home really when you, when you lose someone, especially, so I've lost both my parents and that was devastating enough, but there's nothing as devastating as losing a sibling because a sibling is part of your ongoing history, right? Uh, parents, you expect them to come and go. But, but your siblings are supposed to be around with you. And so it, it's, it's really uh, a profound, it's one of the most profound losses that ever occur. Um, but, I, but I think that, so art in many ways, if we're to believe people like um, Frederica Locke, uh, who speaks about Duende in all these ways, art largely, uh, it is argued, evolves to prepare us for death. Right. So you have to imagine. So, so a few years ago, I say a few years ago, I'm very fluid with time. I'm, I'm from I'm Igbo. So maybe 10 years ago, uh, we did a Poetry Africa talk. Kwame Dawes, myself, uh, Lebo, Mashile, uh, TJ Dema, uh, Khadija. There were a few of us. And we, we literally, it's a, a Babylon by bus. We were driving through, you know, from Botswana to, to Malawi to, to Zimbabwe and all of that. And we were in Zimbabwe and we had a day before the, the, the festival began. And so we, we went out and we drove to this place. We didn't even know where it was. And this guy who was driving us kept telling us he would be profoundly amazed. So as we got off this dirt road, on one side, we see a beautiful building that later turned out to be a bar. But beautiful traditional architecture and to the right was what looked like a sloping gray rock so then we walked up it and there was nothing and then he pointed to the side and we went down and as you come around the side this sheer rock of red it's like a cliff maybe a hundred feet high rises above you and all over it were these petroglyphs and there was no fence there was no one to stop you from touching anything and it's like it's like you entered into a temple it was the most amazing moment. Hush just fell over the group. And so we were walking around, and then I came upon, break about eye level with me, this beautiful blue elephant that had been painted on the wall. 
Now, by estimations of the guide and archaeologists who've been there, this was about five, 6,000 years old. But it looked like it had been painted yesterday. Mm. And right next to it, in white chalk, someone had put a handprint. So here's this handprint made by someone. Because, because I did the DNA test and I have, like, I have sand and, and, and sort of Central Africa, all kinds of DNAs inside me by someone who I may have a blood relationship to. I remember putting my hand in that handprint and just breaking down. Um, because in that one instant, there's no death. This person is not die dead. So, so this is a thing about literature, whether it's poetry or prose or, in fact, art as a whole, rock paintings, music, um, is that what it does is it, it's the thing that says we will never die, right? And so, so, and this is really fascinating because in all texts across the world, all creation stories begin with the word. And there was a word, and, and, so, and so this is, um, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful idea that the one thing that separates us from all other species is the ability to speak. And so language is the most advanced technology ever invented. It makes everything else possible. And so, and so I don't know what happened to me. <laughs> uh, oh, there we are. And so, and so, and so I think that, that that's really what it is, is that we understand something very clearly that there's a commonality to us and that anything we can share, anything that becomes something that is within this simple human archive is what sustains uh, a whole thing. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> and, and you know, um, this idea that it's, art is this thing that said we'll never die is absolutely, it's a beautiful way to say it. Um, there's something very interesting that, that's also preserved in stone and rock that I, hearing you reminds me of a similar experience I had in, in Somaliland in a cave where you see those drawings, but there's something about the stone as much as the drawings. It's that durability of the surface, that it's still there to carry the, the weight of those words or that drawing, that um, I, can, I can understand that, that, that feeling there's a sacredness there that goes beyond anything what an incredible experience chris Thank you. i've had a lot of people here asking some questions and um i think one of the things that connects to what you've been saying is this idea of um the power of words and somebody i think it was troy wanted to know if you felt the duty to speak truth to power in your writing? Is that a duty? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, truth is a questionable thing. Power is a questionable thing. Power, power sustains itself through the mythology of power, right? So I, I, my only duty is to the integrity of the story I'm trying to render. Um, because my work is really always only trying to find out one thing. It's like, what is the full capacity and range of humanness? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be human? And, and, and so, you know, many people write for different reasons, but, um, but that's, the, that's, that's the reason. And so I follow that with absolute integrity, regardless of the outcome. So sometimes I follow these truths so deeply that, that they become viscerally painful journeys for the, for the, for the writer or for the reader. And, and so sometimes people can turn away from the work um, for those reasons, because my work will bring you comfort, but not, not the comfort of a cup of tea on a rainy day. It brings a comfort that is a little bit more uh, damaging, you know, to, 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 as we were talking about the coronavirus and, you know, I, I, I have a lot of friends who sort of, as most of us are, tend to melt down in these moments and, and sort of complain about why it's happening to us and all this sort of stuff. And I, I said, well, my spiritual exercise in this moment is every day to try to ask myself 
or imagine that the coronavirus takes on a human shape and arrives at my door and rings a bell and says, give me one reason why your death on this planet is so terrible that the planet will be impacted in a serious way. Mm. I can't think of one. If you take away bees, the planet dies. If you take away trees, we all go. If the sun goes, we all go. But there is no real reason that my life is any more important than a bird's life. And, and sort of in that moment, it's, it's your life, your, your, your sense of self, I think, begins to, as a small thing with a boundary, begins to vanish a little bit. And you, you try to extend yourself into that lineage that's painted caves and, and has been painting light through the world for a long time. And so it's never about you. It becomes about an unending stream, which is why the word is the word. Yeah. You know, so it's never, you're just, a, you're, if you think you're any, anything more than a conduit for something bigger than you, then, uh, you know, it's, it's, well, I mean, I can't, I'm not judging, but I'm saying, what a lot of stress you're giving yourself. Because, you know, every time you, you put that stress on yourself, then you have to live up to it. And I'm, frankly, I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> it's, it's just too much work. <laughs> um, it's interesting uh, it's interesting that you're talking, you, it's these conduits, um, but you know, in a way, I, but I also think, and I'm thinking about your brother and the losses we feel when human beings are from our, leave from our world, and there's, that's a significance, you know, we are significant to, to other people, maybe not in the larger scheme, um, but I wondered, listening to this poem, um, if you could talk a little bit more about what it was like to move, did the poetry help you move through this space that was suddenly absent of a brother? How how did this how did the poems and and the that writing of this um, did it did it help in any way with uh, understanding how to express loss or mourning or maybe artistic expression? Um, so, so the beautiful thing about, it's funny because you talked about the ways in which, uh, uh the law, you know, we're, we're woven into a fabric. Um, but it's also, you know, most of us never have the privilege of watching someone go, of sort of being the person who sang someone over because it gets to a point where you, you have to let them go. You literally have to say to them, it's okay now, you can go. And so what carries them out is a word, mm -hmm. right? It's sound that takes them out, but it's the sound of your release. And so, again, I'm speaking about connection, not in the sense of individual beings. And this is something, again, that's very profound. And I would say, I don't want to speak for every culture, but I'll say across West Africa, um, is this idea that you're part of a mat, a mat that's woven, right? And so, and so you're, 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 you're important in the sense that you create an integrity, right? And I don't mean integrity in terms of like moral, morality, but just like a structural integrity of this fabric. And so, but when you go, another life comes to replace that. And so f for me, these poems are entirely selfish because my brother is fine. And in fact, in many ways, uh, sometimes what I'm, what I'm doing, I'm not writing for the dead. I'm, I'm writing for the living. This is, this is a thing about writing, about literature, is that it's, it's, what it's doing is taking this individual life that, was, that has gone over and we've, we're sort of trying to weave it back into a larger fabric. So it's never about my brother. It's about everyone other people have lost that they encounter in this page is about my brother. We can't feel another person's grief. It's impossible. We can approximate it. And that approximation is the affirmation that we are human. Mm -hmm. Right? So always art is an approximation of loss. In fact, we can, we can almost argue, and Pliny the Elder does, that the beginnings of sculpture happens when, when a, a young woman is about to lose her lover to a war. And so she makes this simulacrum to preserve him. So, so it seems like loss and production 
are, are these beautiful things because it's always like on the cusp of as something's going out, something's coming in. So if you're a person who creates or wants to create, you have to sort of sit in that nebulous place. Yeah. So any, anything, it's, it's, someone's asking, is it literature that allows us to be connected to each other? I don't think it's literature. I think it's the considered word. It's just a word that has had thought behind it. Um, in my village, we say, not, not every utterance is a word. <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> but I mean, you can imagine, if we just throw our heads back to all the recent plane crashes that have happened, but, but the ones that got a lot more publicity, say the 9-11, and you can hear the tapes from that and transcripts where people call, they're about to die and you have to call someone you love and tell them that you're about to die. So even, even the word, I love you, doesn't, the phrase, I love you means nothing in that moment. And yet, yet it's still the first thing people do is an attempt to reach other people in conversation. Yeah. So I think it's really more, less about literature, more about the human need to feel connected but not to feel connected in these um, self-centered ways, but rather just, <laughs> is, just watch, watch, you know, <laughs> I say this and it may seem strange, but like when you, when you watch rural women, you understand what, what a gift the rural women are to the world because they sustain all the histories, all the stories, all the fabrics. And that that sense of sustainability that they weave through songs and every day you know they have they have rituals for how the cassava is harvested what side is planted on everything has a profound meaning it's not you know we we the difficult thing about being a modern african is that so much of what would have been the ways we were as people is lost right in this kind of progress and and that's also a beautiful struggle because how can you not how can you not lose it? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I rambled. You should stop me. Oh, this is, this is <laughs> ab absolutely. And I think this is also a, a good uh, transition to the next poem. And then I have, um, I have many more questions for you. Okay. Um, this one is called White Egret. For those in Nigeria, it's Licky Licky. <laughs> Epigraph. The whole earth is filled with the love of God, Kwame Dawes. A stream in a forest and a boy fishing, heart aflame, head hush, tasting the world, lick and pant. The holy scripture is animal, not book. I should know, I have smoked the soul of God, psalms burning between fingers on an African afternoon, and how is it that death can open up an alleluia from the core of a man? How easily the profound fritters away in words. And the simple wisdom of my brother, what you taste with abandon, even God cannot take from you. All my life, men with blackened insides have fought to keep the flutter of a white egret in my chest from bursting into flight and glory. Excuse me, I, I got to put the iPad down because I'm noticing that my throat's going to I need a, I need a drink and I can't, uh, I can't do a, I don't want to advertise Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. um, thank you for that. Can you talk about the inspiration behind that poem a little bit? Um, well, it comes from many places. Um, Many cultures talk about, you know, the, be the beautiful thing is that I'm trying to, in many ways, in subtle ways, re-archive the culture I come from. So there are many cultures in which, in which white birds are birds of purity. And, and the idea of purity, of course, is that it, it has no inflection. So it's not good. It's not bad. It's just a, a bird. And so when we were kids, these beautiful white cattle egret who stomp around in the mud with the buffaloes and the cows, every time they fly up to the, to, to the sky, there's never a fleck of mud on them. It's almost like they live in mud, but they're beyond mud. 
And so this is almost what I try to do with the writing, the idea that the writing lives in difficulty, but it was always trying to break for transcendence. But then also, like as kids, when they, these birds would fly over, we would always sing in Igbo, leke leke nyembocha weremboji, which means leke leke, take all the dirty flecks in my, in my nails and give me white nails, right? And it's interesting too, because there are all these ways in which Igbo and Yoruba as languages share so many commonalities. And I think we were all one people from the not culture and some went east and some went west. And so every time I encounter these words too, it's also a kind of union. But also for those of you who know, as a Babalao, Leke Leke has become very important in, in, in sort of the system of traditional worship. Um, and also my particular Odu, the Leke Leke is prominent. So I kind of started to think about this idea of white egrets. And, and then I started to go back to the work of Derek Walcott, which talks about this. And then I started to find um, in all kinds of African artists, the presence of the white bird, right? Mm -hmm. whether, it's the, whether it's the white pigeon, the dove, the egret. And so I started to, to sort of look at the ways in which all of that would happen. And then uh, what I'm literally saying is that as kids, we, we, my father had this beautiful King James Bible, and we were Catholic, so he never really read it. It had been a gift. But we were mad at him one summer because he had taken to punishing my brother and I and, like, beaten us with this. It felt like a 10-pound Bible. And so we started tearing pages from the Psalms and rolling them and filling them with, with, with the local herb, and we would smoke these, and these plumes of white smoke, um, as a kind of quiet rebellion. And, and there was something about smoking the word, literally the word of God. So it's literally you're smoking this thing that is very profound um, and it's an act of rebellion. And then, and then so the plumes of smoke started to look like birds. And I grew up with forest fires and always you, when they started happening, you see the hawks circling and they would dive down in and grab food. And, and so for me, I, I grew up in, in, in a culture that was always poised between loss and recuperation, loss and recuperation. In fact, there's a Yoruba proverb, which is part of an Odu we talk about, but I'll say it in English. It's literally like, the hawk is not hurt by the forest fire. Instead, it benefits from it because it, it sort of dives down, right? So, so I think that part of, um, part of what we, 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 when you're making art, you're trying to find you're speaking English because that's the audience and you're really talking about Christianity because that's the kind of the, the moment you're speaking about. But how do you subvert that and infuse it with all these layers of things, but also with boys and boyhood? And, 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 and so that's kind of where you start to come into this. It's, just, it's like you're trying to weave the mat. You're trying to be part of this mat that comes before you. Hmm. That's um, what, what you're saying in terms of that loss and, and recuperation. And um, it calls to mind also your work in photography. Mm. Um, it's really interesting that you think of the writing and art as a, a re-archiving of culture, the way that you approach your work. And how does the photography that you do connect with this as well? Um, well, I... <laughs> So, so, you know, so much, when you ask most writers, well, when I've asked writers who had the most influence on in you, you know, they always go, they always want to sound profound. Like, we're not that profound, right? Almost everything that becomes the sort of a creative pool you draw from has happened to you by the time you're 12, right? Everything else later is just like formal experiments. So you can say Toni Morrison all you want, but it has nothing to do with that. It's a mixture of all the bad cartoons and, and the comic books you read and where you played and how you played and what, how alive was the culture. To divide the privilege, you know, I, le I had a white mother, so I had this whole English strand running through me. Um, and, then, and then you have the whole... Um, sort of living in a city, but going to the village all the time. So then you're re recreating um, rituals. You're being made to do rituals that have, that, that have held your people in place for thousands of years. So you're always living on this kind of cusp of stitching. You're always stitching. And so, and so um, to, to, <laughs> to, 
to grow up then in the 70s in these small towns, you realize how important photographs were. Things we take for granted now, how much people saved to take photographs. Yeah. And if you went into a house in those days, all around the living room would be these photographs, families, generations. So like it was the genealogy of people, right? Yeah. Right. And so, and so in this kind of way, um, photography represented for me a way to capture art, simple living art. And, and you watched the process with people who would make it. You know, these were all Rolleiflex cameras and you're looking down. It's just a beautiful thing to watch. And to, and to, to, watch, to watch, most of those photographers were men. And, and to watch those, those, those men who would drink and were gruff in other times disappear so much into uh, those cameras, into a moment of beauty, stay with me. And so, and so for me, photography is this beautiful gift every day to sort of, when I'm too lazy to make anything else, I can make this one small moment of art, this one small moment of art. And as you take photographs you begin to realize there's nothing to do with cameras you're not recording what's already there your your repos it's an intervention yeah. right so itself is it's already a lie right so 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 that's 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 really what it is you know and so and so when i start to think of that or even music like i'm i'm if I had was ever as good as I imagined I could have been on the saxophone, which was I, I taught myself at 30, so you can just get by, I wouldn't even write. There's something to some art forms that are so profound, that are just so profound. And so for me, the, to have means and time to, to be able to play in all these other fields is, is a joy. And, and so I share them. Like my Instagram page is just, I'm hardly in them. It's just photographs of, of, of the gifts of seeing. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I, I have, I, okay, hold this thought because I want to ask you after these next questions about the photographs that are right behind you. But I want to get to a couple of the reader, uh, the viewers' questions here. Um, Remy wanted to know, um, have you read anything that altered your perception about spirituality? And um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask that and then I have another one. Okay. Um, so I grew I went to seminary to be a priest as a kid and I got kicked out a couple of times. Um, so, so I was always involved in some kind of religious stuff as a kid, right? And then, and then I grew up with 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 traditional culture you know in nigeria in in africa in particular you're not a man unless you have gone through the rites and so not only will we initiate into all these kinds of rites my grand uncle uh, who i'm supposed to be really incarnation of uh was just charging the family so he passed it down and so i was taught as a kid to 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 do all kinds of ancestral religions and to know how to make certain kind of what well, for one let's just call it orisha because this is in Ibu, we call it there uh, and so i i had all of that relationship to it and then i went through this weird thing of <laughs> tibetan buddhism Hare krishnaism i was looking for something i don't know what and it finally was it happened when kola wolo shitola uh, who's, who was a very well-known, profound Baba Lawa Nigeria, initiated me into Ifa. So it's like, you, it's this kind of way where you start with something and you leave it for a long time and you come back to it. So it's actually being initiated into Ifa and contending with the texts of this, of this yeah. religion that has had the most profound shift. It is the most ethically difficult path I've ever had to, I've ever had to walk. And it so altered me that I don't, I'm always, it's become clear to me that I'm Chris. So it's at the core of who I am. So that, that's the most important thing there is. Everything else comes after that. So yeah, it's sort of like, um, it's, it's, it's affected me so deeply. I, I, words can't quite ex express uh, what it is, you know? Yeah. Mm. Uh, Molara had a question. Um... As a Babalao, does Ifa figure in your writing? 
it definitely figures in my in my poetry um be- <laughs> Awo do yigi, I'm a terrible singer, so forgive me. Awo do yigi yigi, ota o mi o. Awo do yigi yigi, ota o mi. Awo do yigi yigi, awo kumo. Awo do yigi yigi, ota o mi. Afare bale, ariki o. Afare bale, ariki, afare bale, awo kumo. Avare bale adiki. Awo do yigi yigi ota umi o. Awo do yigi yigi ota umi. Awo do yigi yiga o kumo. Awo do yigi yigi ota umi. It's a simple prayer, an incantation we do with water every morning. The closest translation I can come to it is this. Is it the water that shapes the stone at the bottom of the river? Or the river or the stone that shapes the river? I do not know the answer to this. And it is for this reason I come to the mat every day to prostrate. It is for this reason that I know life will protect us from from death. Every day I return to the chant. And it doesn't matter if the river shapes the stone or the stone shapes the river. The very struggle is what means we will never die. So all through my poems, you can hear this. You can hear the rhythm. You can hear, you can hear even the, the modulations. You can hear this attempt always um, towards transformation. And so it's so funny to me because we come from a living, is still alive, archive and heritage of philosophy that, and, and practice that makes Western thought infantile when you think about it. You know, these are coming from people who have no formal education, as we would like to think. And yet everything, everything they try to do is towards a transformation. And with what? Six words that repeat themselves. And the power of some of these things is not only that they exist in the world for you to ponder, but the very, inc- the ways they juxtapose, it's like a sound technology, things, it affects you psychologically and literally shifts your way of being, your way of thinking. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know that it can't have a profound effect on the work I make. I, I more than anything, I feel like I let it down. It's interesting that we, in that prayer, we're back again to stone and what what stone carries. Well, they say stones are the most enlightened beings because they're the most stable consciousnesses on the planet, which is why we use them usually in the base of making a shrine. Mm -hmm. Human beings are not reliable. (laughs) We fluctuate too much. So stones carry the memory of the very planet itself and everyone who's ever lived here and yet remain stable. They move, they change, but at such incremental levels that everything that gets recorded is recorded in the earth. And the stones are the most, are the, uh, almost like the, <laughs> the computer chips, right? Mm-hmm. They're the sort of what hold, uh, they hold the whole story. Just like earthworms are some of the most profound creatures. You, do you know that every grain of earth has been passed through a worm from the <laughs> beginning of time? Yes, so that your whole topsoil, everything you think of is a gift from worms. The planet is alive because of this creature you don't see and works and you never notice. That in Yoruba is what we call ashekpakpa. <laughs> Those who know, know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I have um, someone. I think uh, me asked the response. Let me see if I can read this. The response of religion makes me think of the Virgin of the Flames. Mm. Apart from other important achievements, strikes me profoundly religious. Were your religious experiences infused into it? Yes. 
Well, yeah, that's sort of <laughs> that's sort of based on um, that's sort of a, a based on this idea of Catholicism. You know, for all its faults, in its purest form, Catholicism is a beautiful way of being. Um, and everyday priests, not you know, they have scandals. But when I think, even just as a as a former Biafran, that most of us are alive today because um, the Catholic Church didn't abandon us. So, so one of the things that isn't often talked about is the Red Cross pulled out of West Africa, pulled out of Ebola very quickly because they were funded by the American government. And so the only, for a very long time, the only thing keeping us alive with food and was Caritas, the Catholic uh, agency. Mm. And there are priests and priests and nuns. And my, my sister Stella was delivered in a bomb raid in a hospital in Emekuku by, 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 by a midwife, Sister Tumi, who is just me, my mother and her. The rest were at the, at the refugee camp. And we managed, and she wouldn't leave the hospital until she had to, they know, because she couldn't move my mother, so she wasn't going to leave. So, so there's all these ways in which um, religion, but the beautiful. So, and my mother was was a Church of England. Met my father converted, and like all mad converts, was so into the religion that it went out of hand a little bit. But my mother had no belief in the Pope, had no real belief in the church. She had her faith in, in the practice. And I used to watch and negotiate this, all the complications and contradictions. And so for me, when I was writing The Virgin of Flames, which has to do with gender and sexuality and blackness and body and masculinity and all the violence of masculinity, I could think of no better way than sitting it in East Los Angeles with, with a half African character who's negotiating all the kinds of tyrannies and beauties of Catholicism because you know if you if you think about it with the crucifixion that the Catholics are either crucifixionists or resurrectionists but I'm always interested in what's in between so yes it's, it's so it's not really a struggle with religion as a, as an institution but there's something about the human being that needs religion as a language right so even if you meet the most ardent scientists that's all religious the most ardent atheist. It's all religious. Like it's something about the coding of this language, both in affirmation and denial, that are always about reaching for something bigger. Human beings are always reaching for something bigger. And that's what I try to celebrate in all its complications and all its grime. Thank you, Chris. That's fantastic. I think let, um, let's go to uh, a poem now, um, just so that we can get that in. And then I have some more questions for you. Okay. This one is called Thread. A small gutter in front of a wood and tin shack. Inside a woman and a sewing machine chatter in repair of things that can never be gathered again. For a forced migration, even Atlantic, even Mediterranean. For a flight from a definite death. For a woman drowning to save her child. For slavery, the new heavy with the grit of desert. For slavery, the old heavy with salt water. For a boat following ocean to plowed field. To make restitution is an impossible dream. The final measure of a body's desperation hums to buoyancy, to wish, not to the fact of ruin. The red earth of my homeland is both wound and suture. Nomad is the human urge. Fear is the need to stay. Word is what says not even one of us will be forgotten. Mm. Yeah. That, that these are all acts of remembrance in, in each of these poems that you've just read. And um, this last one really... Um, is a little bit more explicit about that, but I, but it makes perfect sense to me that this, this writing is a loss and recuperation mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Could you talk a little bit about this poem that 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 line about that red of the earth being both a wound and a suture? Yeah, that's stunning. Well, <laughs> thank you. You know, every. Every modern African has a very complex, and I use that word only because if 
I started listing nations, we'll be here all day. <laughs> so I just use it as a kind of collective convenience. But I think every modern African has a real struggle between all the beauty that the continent offers us. And I don't just mean it's postcard beauty. I just mean so much that is essential for us to breathe, right? So there's a lot of ways in which if you leave and come back, the moment your leg touches, your foot touches the ground, you kind of go, <sighs> right? And, and then at the same time, so much that has gone awry, not because of any tradition, much of what we call our tradition and our culture is just perverted Victorian English bullshit that they, that they brought to us, right? I'm talking about indigeneity, such a, where everything is negotiated. So, so we're always struggling between all this difficulty. It seems like we're always caught in a trauma that we can't seem to resolve. And yet we're sitting on the thing that is the only resolution possible. And so it's sort of to me, and it's almost always because at least in much of West Africa, topsoil is always red, right? You dig down a little bit and then you find the black loam. So this idea, like the whole, the whole place seems scarred by blood. And yet it is the very thing that is the lifeblood of the planet that sustains, you know, it's the home of everything and everything can only find itself when it comes home. I cannot help hearing you talk about this and this is going to feel like a non, non sequitur, but I promise it makes sense, I promise. But Chris, the tattoos that you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I promise there's a line of, there's a train of thought, line of thought here, but that act of, of marking the body of, of something that's both a wound in the future and decorate, you know, decorate, decorative or um, an affirmation of something. Um, I can't, I was thinking of all of this as you're just talking about this. Can we talk about that, the bodily art also? <laughs> yes. Um, and as we're talking, I'm looking away only because I'm searching for a poem in here that can speak to that a little bit. So, you know, <laughs> when I grew up, I grew up in a culture, an evil culture, where there was a lot of tattoos and body, body uh, art. It's called Uli in Igbo land. And, and parts of it you see in Sibidi writing, which comes from Ijega Manekoi into Igbo land. Um, and so I've always, I've always, I grew up with old, beautiful old women. So I, the beauty of growing up, as I used to say in Nigeria, Bushman, I grew up in the bush. Afipo is a town that still doesn't have a bridge over the river. So you can't go there by accident. You have to be going there. And so when I was growing up there in the 70s, old women still walked around bare-chested, right, with beads and all these beautiful body art that was well, just transcendent. So I really wanted tattoos. <laughs> and so my both, I started to get tattoos when I was 42. And it was after I got initiated into Ifa and both I waited until both my parents were, were dead because can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> at, 40, at 43 they will still beat me up so <laughs> so I started to get these um these tattoos and to mark initiations the mm -hmm. deeper levels as I was progressing through this sort of spiritual transformation uh trying to trying to create um, a body that could possibly be a record of this, but also celebrate it and celebrate the past. And so the tattoos became that, and each one of them has a story and was earned, literally earned after a different kind of, a different tattoo. Isn't it funny that the poem I'm looking for, it's like I've got this whole manuscript spread out and I can't find it. So the tattoos are not just body decoration. They are, uh, they are an invocation to all those old women oh. who, knowingly or not, made me who I am. You know, um, if, you're, if you're ever lucky, if you're ever lucky uh, as a man, you find you'll be gifted with old women, and, and we call them, you know, Iyawi. Yami, who who will uh, which were misinterpreted, but powerful women who yeah. will, who who, are, who will who will turn your life around. And all African epics actually are 
center around uh, the hero without with who, who or with who the the magical mother or the magical sister provide him all the power he has. So it's an interesting thing. Um, men think they have power, but they do not have power. And the day women stop giving the myth of patriarchy any any power, <laughs> <laughs> it will. Uh, and I hope it's soon. It will. It will fall away. Here's the poem I've been looking for. Okay. Lineage. Someone has always wanted my skin. For the ego, it was a genocide of the arrow. For the arrow, it was a devastation of the British. For the British, it was my father's quiet revenge, blow after blow, dealt to my mother, his white English wife. Rupture and repair, scar and keloid. My skin is the voice of my ancestors sounding in the well of a drum. My skin is a cloaked, sacred, painted spells. I have released the anger inside me, a bird flying across oceans, dying a thousand deaths but never dead. My body is the house of tomorrow. My skin is prophecy. Mm. I hope that answers the tattoo question on so many levels. It does. Molara wanted to know about the body as a palimpsest. And I think that poem answers a lot of that already. The, if um, the body is a palimpsest? Yes, I mean, who was Madhubunani is a human being a thing, a one thing. Human beings are made up of multiple things. And we know this even, even in, in, within all these cultures. Um, I wish I knew more about different cultures. Uh, just, just your head alone, right? In, in um, Yoruba's Uri, Uriode is sort of like, in many ways, you can think of it as your outer head, your frontal lobe. Uri, no, you can think of it almost as um, that part of you that has a conscience, right? But there is also different parts of Uri, right? And the, the bird, the bird, which is women's power, it resides in the head. So the head is, is, is sort of, so, and then everything has, a, and even the head is divided, Iwaju and all these other places. But also if you're as a Babalao, when you're doing things, you realize that, that the body is seen as a microcosm of the macrocosm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll do, we'll do an offering to your elbow what we're doing an offering to is the fulcrum that moves you into the world because without an elbow you can't bend your hand you can't trade you can't trade you can't do anything without a knee it doesn't you can't really do much with your body so all the body joints are considered points of consciousness which i think western medicine is coming to understand but it's really the idea of fulcrum that 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 there are different energy points in your body that trauma and ancestral stuff can get trapped in and the this is released. So just on that level alone, the body is considered a palimpsest okay. of different parts. And, and these parts are not sort of seen to, to, to be spirit in the way we think about spirituality. Because anybody who's attended a West African ritual knows that in the middle of it, if the priest's phone rings, you answer his phone. Go, who knows? Come that customer. Right? <laughs> so it's none of this new age ooh, stuff. It, it's a very profound understanding about about our interdependence, not just on the natural phenomena in the world, but the idea of a whole planet. If you, if you look at a, an opon, if I like the divining board, when we put the erosum, the powder on it, we move it this way in a kind of like swirl. If you stand back and look at it and you put a picture of the Milky Way, you actually see that it mirrors the Milky Way. There is this understanding of who we are and what we're doing and where we're connected to, embedded in the beauty of it is that it's hidden. It's a palimpsest itself. Every textual reference just is, is so even Yoruba and Igbo are contractions, right? So my cousin, his name, last name is Agwa, which means snake. But his full name is Agwa Dabuchuzo Nakike, when the mighty snake who is powerful, more powerful than the python, straddles the road, who dares cross? <laughs> so sometimes he just a way he would issue a threat to people is like in my Maguna double choose I'm the snake across the road and people back away. So you can speak in these languages and only people who have access access to the deeper layers will understand. That's why the word is so important where I come from. And which is why to speak well, even you in Achebe, to speak well is the is the gift of intelligence. Because it means that you have learned not only tact, 
but you've learned this kind of palimpsest of hiding things within things within things to allow people to unpack it slowly. Mm -hmm. The word is a tied up knot. It is gently that we untie it to understand. And in the middle of it, there's nothing. As Molora said, to! I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we are running out of time and this thing will just cut us off quickly. Um, but I just want to make sure I can get one more question in from somebody who wanted to hear you talk about your work as a publisher, publishing mm. other people's work and what do you look for? Um, just some general information and hopefully it won't cut us off, but let's see. Right. Well, in, in the past when I had my own separate press, I was always looking for called Black Goat, which we, doesn't, we don't operate anymore, but we're always looking for uh, the powerful things, uh, the powerful things that never get voice, right? So pop, women writing complicated language poetry, maybe from other cultures, maybe from other, or women whose language is not obeying decency. It's just beautiful things that would never find a light somewhere else. And now the African Poetry Book Fund, with which I'm just a part of, uh, we, we're looking for, we're not looking for anything. We're hoping to cultivate an archive of African poetry in the moment from, and it's very Pan-African from the, from the North all the way to South, East and West. So we open up submissions every year and people send work in and the books that we can't publish as full books, we offer the chat book route to, to people. We wish we could do more. Uh, luckily in, in um, it's like eight or nine years, we've managed to publish close to 100 chapbooks and maybe 40 other books which, of African poetry, which we're grateful for and to see the range of voices. So no one thing. We're just looking for excellence. Okay. So let's say in the last minute that we have, um, could you talk about the photograph right behind you? Baldwin is everything. Baldwin uh -huh. is... I, <laughs> It is, I, I'm hesitant to say, let me just say, I was very, very young when I read Baldwin and I read Another Country and it literally so tore me apart that the only way I could, I could really figure about it, I could talk about it later when I grew up was that uh, Baldwin literally has said that, I'm paraphrasing, but I think at the heart of it, this is really what all his work is about, that the only, because he deals with homosexuality and all kinds of things, race and, and violence, but he says the only aberration in this world is the absence of love. Mm. Not a sentimental kind of love, not, um, not a hallmark kind of love, but the ability to transform. And this man up here, Miles Davis, <laughs> Miles Davis for me is a real revolutionary. He, he, he defies racism in ways no one else does and continues to innovate. He's the first person to record with stereo recording in the 40s and in the 70s he's doing stuff with electronic music. So, so for me, it's always the idea that I want to be the artist who's never afraid to innovate. That's and so can I, can I leave you with one poem? Yes, but let me tell you this. If we get cut off, just hit save story. Don't hit delete. Okay. Okay. Incantation. What words can you wrap around a dying brother, still dying, even now? A man who has not eaten for a month sips at water and says, even thirst is a gift. He asks what other gifts God has given him. I'm your gift, his daughter says from a corner, and he smiles and rasps. You can only unwrap a child once. The rest is prayer and even more prayer. You sing softly to him in a language only the two of you speak, and he snores softly into your palm, breath and blood. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, so I do I end it or do we just wait for it to run out? It's like 25 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Keep talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It might cut us off. Who knows how much time we have? That was such a beautiful, a uh, beautiful way to close, though. I, um, so I think we can, we can end it from here. Okay. So Thank you. I'm just, just going to figure out the technology of that Thank and you. how to save it. <laughs>